Hey, everybody, we're live on a special, special, special Sunday edition. I normally don't do Sundays, but certain people get that carte blanche. <laughs> so he's already giggling. Certain people that I adore and admire, and I can say that I know a long, long time, revere their work. Um, and then when they agree to tell me with their busy schedules that maybe a Wednesday doesn't work because we're booked up, yeah. I tried to say to them, well, then we need to get you in as soon as possible because as soon as I get that okay, I don't want them to go gun shy and leave me and say, forget it. I ain't doing it. Go away. No, this is not this kid. <laughs> <laughs> this is not this kid. <laughs> Welcome to True House Stories. I am Lenny Fontana for the special Sunday edition coming out of New York City, Nueva York, New York. As an Italiano say, New York City, the mm. only place to play the disco. So <laughs> you got somebody who's a real disco boy like I am and who has taken uh. this career from the disco era to beyond. Mm. And he was revered in the Soulful House scene for a long time as a, as a guru. His music background is extensive. If you've ever experienced 14 hours of clubbing with him, you should consider yourself blessed and lucky. Um, he's got fantastic taste in music because I know, I know how he, I've heard him play many times and he can take you on what we call the true journey. He's also part of the movement in New York with certain labels like Twisted, Tribal America. He's done so much for the industry. He takes his sound around the earth and beyond. And if they could put him on a rocket ship, they would. <laughs> I don't know if he would take to go, but he, you know, it's getting pretty close. I think his next gig will be in Mars. Anyway, I'd like to welcome Brooklyn Zone. He's all over the earth, Florida too. You all know him down there too. Mr. Danny Teneglia. Lenny, I love you, man. Thank you for that introduction. That was, uh, I'm blushing. It's not makeup. <laughs> That's what I want, Danny. David Morales said the same thing to me. He says, next time I go out on gigs, I must have you do the introductions. Yeah. Like, Whoa. Is he talking about me? I'm like, <laughs> well, you do have great taste in music because we've talked over the years at times. And I know, you know, all the same crew of people, mm -hmm. even though I don't see you that often. Somehow we're five degrees separated from each other, from everybody that we're around, you know, and I know I've heard even people repeat from others like this. I may have done something kind of funky that maybe wasn't kosher. And someone would say to me, yeah, Danny said, Lenny knows better. <laughs> the stuff like that. I mean, this is 25 years ago, but he knows better. So I take that with a compliment when I hear those types of things from guys like yourself, because, you know, you are a major impact in the game. And there's been times I remember when you stuck up for guys like Armand Van Helden, when he had the hottest tracks out at that time, Sugar Sweeter. And I remember you saying, hey, everyone, give it up for Armand Van Helden. And I remember reading that stuff. So you're a champion as a DJ promoter besides you being the producer, Grammy-nominated remixer, blah, 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 and all that's wonderful stuff. So enough of that. First question, of course, everybody wants to know how you're doing and how have you made it through COVID? You know, that's been a big thing with all of us. Well, first, let me say thank you so much. And I, I got to give it up to you as well. I mean, you're a legend in your own right. You know, you see a Frankie Knuckles play your songs at Sound Factory Bar and I go peep what it is and I was like, really, Lenny? So, yeah, but did, we yeah. don't be just like that. When we saw each other, hey, Paisan, how you yeah. doing? You know, if we saw each other at the 18th Avenue feast, it'd be just like we laugh, things like that. But we don't, we don't look at ourselves like that. We look at ourselves, revere each other as working guys that do what we do. Right, we can't be fans of ourselves. Yeah, it's tough. So, thank you, and I appreciate that. You know, plug. I pay, I sent them some PayPal. Everybody, don't worry. <laughs> be <Bimo. laughs> But anyway, COVID's, so, yeah. been, COVID's been a mofo for everybody. So how have you, you know, dealt with the coping of COVID? And, and yeah, well, it started out 
really hard for me because, you know, it popped around in January of 2020. And right around Easter, April of 2020, my younger brother on Long Island got extremely sick with it. And he was hospitalized and he was probably a day away from going on a ventilator. But I think, honestly, all the prayers really spared him. And, you know, because that would have been tough for him because he has like a heart condition. So I was in Miami at the time. And back then, you couldn't go visit a patient anyway. So here I am thinking, well, if I even drove to New York, I wouldn't be able to go see my baby brother up in the hospital. So it was stressful. It was really stressful. And uh, then on top of that was the taking care of myself and making sure if I go to the stores, wear the mask and living in a high-rise condo, you're sharing elevators. It was it was mind if you ch <laughs> and uh, so thank god the vaccine was invented uh, i got the shots in march and april of this year and i you know it relieved me a lot of uh the paranoia if you will but it, it it's been tough with the gigs as well because i was out of work for a good 14 months and um I ain't even shy to say I had to wind up getting on unemployment and getting help from the government with the PP loan, PPP. And uh, I just call okay. it the PP. That's I just call it the PP yeah, loan. Really, it's a PP, a PP loan. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Listen, it's, listen, you're doing great. No, you know what? I love yeah. that. It's real because I can understand we all were like, that was a major shock to the system. And I'm going to tell you something. I remember seeing the video you put out. And you look so emotional and I could feel that emotion because I was saying the same gosh damn thing to myself. I said, what are we all going to do now? And I know you must have said that. Like, yeah. what? It's a shock to the core that everything is stopping completely. Still to this day, you know, like uh, no winter music conference, ultra fest, Ibiza, you know, so I'm still... I won't say that I'm struggling now that I'm back, you know, taking on some gigs. I recently did a bunch, actually, in the last uh, six weeks. So I'm getting my head above water again. And um, I think I mentioned in our conversation before we started that I had bought property in New Jersey in December of 2019. And um, it was my first time buying an actual home with trees and a lawn and uh, living in like a nice big private house that was going to put the condo up for sale in Miami so everything's affordable. But then COVID happened and then I couldn't sell the condo. So now I have two properties, an employee, all the usual bills that we all have with it, health insurance, car insurance, et cetera. So I was like, oh my God, like, you know, I just bought that house. What am I going to do? And But God helped me through it with the finances and the government. See, it's amazing to hear <clears throat> because even Carl said the same thing. Yeah, we're living hard. You know, yeah, you're working hard up until COVID, but then the expenses you're carrying too. Everything is meets the lifestyle. And when it all stops, <clears throat> she no more. Now what do you do? You know? I don't think Carl has to worry like we <laughs> Well, you know, you know, you know, I'm j i am I mean he said it to me. Yes. Yeah. You, but remember, he says eventually if it doesn't turn back on, we will run out. Because I, I have yeah. to start selling stuff off, he said. It's just the I way I was thinking to call him for a loan. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Cox Banks of the U.S. Yeah, I'm sure. he, yeah. He's such a mentor. So thank God you're all right, you know, and, yeah, and congrats on your, you know, your, your La Casa in the north of Jersey. And he lives in a yeah. sprawling mansion amongst many of wonderful yeah. superstars. And Eddie Murphy's down the block. He's in the <laughs> <laughs> Nice and private. Real He's quiet. Private. Yeah. So how is that is for you coming from Brooklyn? And, and yeah, yeah Williamsburg. Now talk about, you know, urbanized living. <laughs> And and then also a shock of living in Florida in the heat in the in yeah. the winter and and condos because you've always been in the apartment type. Or <clears throat> well, I remember you had the loft in Queens in Long Island City. Right, 
it's it's hard to not to forget to uh, include that. I did have that loft, which was six thousand five hundred square feet, Jesus. for almost fifteen years. Yeah, yeah, and um, actually, it's closer. But no, I moved out after about fifteen, sixteen years, and it became unaffordable because it was in a factory in a commercial district. So you know how the rents keep going up, up, and up, and I had to pay the taxes on it, and I was just doing it by myself, always. Always had in the back of my head that I was going to be able to share that space with someone, make a studio out of it, video. <clears throat> I almost uh, merged with Dub Spot. I wanted to call the loft Club Spot and have the, the guys that go in there and learn and finish their program, whether it's mastering or Pro Tools, Logic, Ableton, that once they finish their program, they could come to the loft and play on that vinyl District 36 sound system, which would probably be considered one of the best systems in New York at the time because everybody was downsizing, right? you know, getting rid of the stacks. And it just never happened. The owner of Dubspot kind of backed out. And things, of course, change, and you start looking at your situation saying, yeah. oh my God, I'm carrying this, I'm <clears throat> carrying that. And I yeah. to downside. That's oh, no, I couldn't afford it. Yeah, you get to a point where you go, this is getting ridiculous now. It was a lot. Because I was in the condo in Miami. So that was like cha ching and cha ching south. Yeah, right. You go, money comes in left hand, money's out the right hand. It's like Yeah. Agents, managers, you know, furniture. <laughs> Yeah, right. Just go. Everybody's on the, as I say, everyone's got a piece of the vig. I, I, I pay a lot of money, not a lot of money, but over the years, one thing that people may not know about me is that as much as I've done, you know, productions, co productions, remixes over the years, I've always hired engineers, programmers. And, you know, that's costly when it comes to a studio session because I, I never studied engineering and I never really had the desire to learn logic or pro tools and all of that. I just wanted to focus on the music, the drums, the bass lines, the synths, and all of the, you know, that fun gear samples. But to get inside these uh, plugins and all that, I just didn't find it interesting. So yeah, that was another expense. Yeah. Right. So we'll talk about that as we go. All right. Well, I want to come to your studio. Look at me. I would love to have you here anytime. And yeah, the monitors there, you got well, the SSL, yeah, the Ted Osbergers, oh, Tennis Tens, the Pioneers, and the Room is Tuned Flat Response. I loved I yeah. anytime you want to come, get that little mono, mono box. What was it called? Oralex or Oratone? Oratone. Oratone. Yeah, well, that's the new remember that. It's called the Avatone. Yeah, this is they, they actually made a same specs. So I got myself just to hear the mix in mono, and it makes such a difference. Everybody, you're mixing. We all let, we used to do, do this trick, the studer, real to real. We used to do <laughs> the speaker and listen to the mix and go. Make the tape machine. Right? <laughs> we listen to the mix. And if it popped through that little speaker, it was a winner. Meanwhile, $10 million in gear, but we're playing it through a $5 like Radio Shack speaker. to really, And it sounded like it was coming from your phone. But you know what's funny, Lenny, is that all this time I kind of forgot with the on a live like stream. I it felt like we were just catching just, up on FaceTime yeah. me and you. That's just, this is why it's so great. That's why I love doing this. <laughs> People are coming in, they're talking, they're they're all yeah. saying hi, and that's why we we are talking. And they're just yeah. they're just like John Morales and them all said, they're just eyeing into our conversation. Right. It's, we're doing what we do. This is what we would do every anyway, guys. See how yeah. we are talking? If I called him, we would be laughing about a lot of things yeah. and talking about a lot of she-she stuff too off camera, which we will not talk about on camera. But anyway. Disco gossip. Disco, disco, <laughs> disco vinyl joke. Disco gossip. And we and Lloyd, Lord, he knows. We it's like we live, we it's hard to explain. I mean, we it's like we get energy from that. 
It's crazy. I can't explain it. It's just like it's human nature, man. It's just, it's just like, part of our thing. like I could be, you know, a corporate office building. It's going to be the same, you know, right? you yeah. put us all in a room. Yeah. You know, you remember when this happened in 1983? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. And how it happens. You start talking anyway, Danny, thank you again. And we're going to ask that first question. You're going to take us on this because there's no one better than you that can paint the picture of what it takes to start somewhere. And everyone has a start. Mm. And I've always asked every person that is generously to come on this show. I say basically either how does music find you or how do you find the music starting in your life? Mm. Well, um, I guess, you know, rewinding, you know, I recently turned 60, although I don't feel it, thank God. And uh, I technically started working as a DJ in 1976, which was a long time ago, at a pub in Brooklyn in Williamsburg that my older brothers would chaperone, make sure I was home in bed by one because my mother and father were strict about that but they knew I wanted to do it so I was just turning 17 it wasn't legal yet and um, before that when I was just a mere child um, my mother's younger sister used to play piano actually she lived right next door to us and she played piano and she would buy records there was a record store on our block and she would babysit me and my brothers when my mom and dad went out and she was the music lover so not only was she playing the records that she bought up the block, it could be, uh, I, I, when I think back on all this, you know, I can think of songs like Grazing in the Grass and um, everything from Beatles, Barbra Streisand, Sinatra, whatever was you know, hip and happening, a lot of Sergio Mendez in Brazil 66, and even some salsa. And I just picked up on it like a magnet. My other brothers probably could care less, but, you know, they loved it. Don't get me wrong. But me, I was like, zoom, the speaker, the piano. I wanted to sit right next to her. And eventually I did learn to play by ear. So the family thought I was going to fall into, you know, being a musician. So they put me into music lessons and I hated the discipline. I was just a kid. I was maybe nine years old. And um, that didn't happen. But I still gravitated to the music. So born in 61, in 71, I'm 10 years old. Soul Train hits the air. Boom. Magnet. You know, there was already American Bandstand. And, you know, I loved the, the music shows. And um, the Jacksons cartoon hit the airwaves. So, of course, I was a Motown yeah, I didn't even mention that as a kid, my aunt playing the Motown, all of the Motown stuff and uh, Philly. That, that's what I think really, really, where I really learned about music was probably through Motown and Philly the most. But yeah, there I was in 1971. And then what is it, 72, that the Love is the Message album came out. Then there's that change in the music. We had it from the Rock Edge but the Beatles started to change and Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye started to get a little more political. I just changed with it all from Pink Floyd, everything. Cause I was listening to what my older brothers were listening to my cousins, very big family, Cream, Led Zeppelin. You know, I, I still love some of that stuff too. So um, it just still continually found me like that magnet to a speaker, to a nightclub, to a record store, to a party. And that's why I said I'm 60, but I still feel like that same kid. Like if, you know, I do miss it. I miss the record stores. I miss the clubs. I miss the social, um, socializing, you know, when you meet up at the record pool or you meet at the record stores on Fridays and the clerks and the people that worked in the shops it was the record companies. You visit the record companies, get the promos, say hello. 
saw Francois of Prelude, like, oh, that's Francois, you know. Michael and, Gomes. Yes. <laughs> Michael yeah, Gomes. I miss that so much, you know. And yeah. now we're living in the digital age, but I still have the passion somehow. You know, um, a lot of us felt the same when the whole lime wire and the digital downloading came and the record shop slowly died one by one. It was a horrible feeling because so many great things happened in the record shops. We all hooked up. Maybe we didn't talk all the time, but we would see each other and magic happened. The nightclubs too. We would see each other. Hey, what are you working on? You find out what's going on. But so sure. that was our way of uh, of getting motivated and inspired because you would see the reactions of people in the shops or the maybe when you walk into the store, uh, you know, even in the latter years, like I would go to like dance tracks or satellite and I'd let them know I was coming and they would have like a stack of records for me to listen to because they had a feeling of which ones I might like, you know, even distributors, you know. And, um, <clears throat> but are we talking about that later because then it would be like, that's a Danny record, that's a junior record, like would say, <laughs> that's a Frankie record, that's a Tony yeah. Humphrey record, that's you, right. Lenny. that's you, that's how they categorize it back then. Now we just, you know, type in or download the promos and you can't see anybody else saying, oh, that's the bomb, or check out that break, or you might want to rework that intro, <laughs> you know, it's all, you know. There's nobody there. Oh, There's nobody. Lenny Fontana. Yeah. Font, font, font. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it is, who was he? You know, there was a, there was a touchy-feely thing going on. Like, you, you pull the record down. You, mm-hmm. Oh, I like that guy. You go check it out. Next yeah. thing you know, or you're the one where somebody says to you, hey, Danny, can you play some records at the shop? And you yeah. start playing records at the shop, and Manny Lehman was good for this, too. He would play a certain section of record, and the record would sell out. Yeah, then you get home, like, why buy this? What <laughs> <laughs> I buy this thing for? What are you <laughs> I'm going to kill her when I see her. $12 import, now I got to buy two? Yeah, I got to <laughs> work two of these now? <laughs> Man, those days, you know what else? What I really miss about uh, the shopping for records, and this goes back to the disco era, is reading the credits. You know, it's like you look at, you see the relations of, you know, who might have done the strings for Silver Convention, and you're like, oh, they did that. And, you know, you see like Cerrone and Don Ray, you know, you put the connection like, oh, it makes sense. And, um, Gino Socio, then he did Quebec Electric. You know, you, you read that, people would never know things like this because it's not there. I mean, unless they go to Discogs and look at the info credit on every record, but most people don't do that. Pick it up and look at it, stare at it, the artwork, and just read the credits. And I'm glad I got to live that era like you did with making records that were promo or sold in shops where you would see keyboards by Peter Dow, Eddie Montilla, engineer by Rob Reeves and just give thanks to special people too. You know, and I missed that because it was a a, a unity, a family of things. Well, it's it's like everything, you know, I always say nothing lasts forever. Nothing. Mm. Including the good times like we did, we had, and you know, I hate to, to reminisce on the golden era because we're still living and making achievements now. But let's go on your story. Let's go back to the 70s because that's really important. Come on. 76, 77, you're, you're playing out. You're starting yes. to get your... Take us on that journey. What's going on in your life at that time? Okay, well, basically when I started, it was pre-disco because... <clears throat> I guess, um, when did the word kind of really blow up in 77 when Studio 54 opened? And in 1976, I believe it was 10% by Double Exposure on Salsa was the first 12-inch to be sold in stores. 
but I was playing before that a few years and I was playing the 45s. I used to shop at Disco Disc on Austin Street in uh, Forest Hills and um, album cuts. So I was playing on these rinky dink turntables. I couldn't afford turntables. You just buy the belt drive cheesy ones. And I'm like slip queuing 45s and album cuts. And I was so poor. <laughs> I used to put one turntable on the left of the balance and one on the right. <clears throat> and that's how I mix. Oh, you because you had no you had no real mixer. You no. Just, the balance control. <laughs> I would just like get those extensions and plug the speakers into both. And I would just uh that's ghetto Brooklyn, right? No, but that's okay. But let me ask you this question. Did you see somebody have a setup that you said, oh, I gotta try this or something? <clears throat> um I can't remember the first time I saw it. Uh, One thing that does come to mind is, do you remember that Disco Gold album cover that had like two Technics turntables on it? The Flamingos, that's the Flamingos booth. Was it Flamingo? I didn't know. Yeah, that's Flamingos, that's Tom Savarese's booth. Two eleven, not the 11, 1800s, I think. Or the the original 12s, the A. Yeah, Yeah, okay. So you saw that. I used to stare at that constantly like hang it up you know like one day i'm going to be behind those two turntables in that mixer which i actually do have i have original 1200s and a silver face bozak which on the back says 1975 so this is before disco exploded but um yeah i mean I could tell you, you know, bands like Ecstasy, Passion and Pain and Early Tramps and things like that were starting to pave the way for disco because, come on, the band behind the Tramps and, you know, Sal Sol Orchestra and MFSB, a lot of the same players. And I just have a quick question for you. When you mentioned you used to go to Austin Street in Forest Hills, Paul Casella played at Monastery, right? Yeah. That's where I was going to go with that, too. That's what I wanted to know. Is that Was Paul Casella like a muse for you or something? Yeah. yeah, Paul was my main number one mentor as a DJ because that's the first DJ I ever heard from my cousin playing his 8-track tapes. And having had that, you know, knowledge of music as a kid and the TV shows and the instruments, my aunt, um, I hear, you know, the weave. And I'm like, How'd they do that? He made that record go right into that one. So he explained to me that, you know, there's DJs now in nightclubs instead of bands. And um, they have two turntables and the mixer and the dance floor. So I called up the number on the tape. I tell the story over and over. And Paul picks up and I'm like, hi, my name is Danny. I'm in Brooklyn. Uh, My cousin's playing eight track tapes. uh, is it possible to get more? <laughs> like something like that. He's like, who is this? You hear like a little kid's voice. And I put my cousin on the phone. He's explaining who he was. And he goes, I recognize you. He goes, where are you? He goes, where are my, <clears throat> uh, my grandmother had a um, bodega. Super, it was called Ladana Superette. That was my mom's maiden name, Ladana. And it was on uh, Metropolitan Avenue and Manhattan Avenue. Now it's an organic market. Uh, we've come for big time. Uh, tofu. What the hell is tofu? Tofu. <clears throat> Paul came over. He was close, and we met. He brought some more tapes, and that was my master class. I just listened to Paul's tapes continuously. Now again, I was only like thirteen, pushing fourteen, I guess, in that zone. But I think I was. If I do the math, it's probably closer to 12. I just can't remember exactly. But I do know that the first time I went to Disco Disc, I went with Paul, and I bought a a 45 import called Let Me Take You Back in Time by Eruption, which was became famous for I Can't Stand the Rain. But before that, and he used to have that on one of his uh, A-tracks, and I went home like mesmerized. Like I got this import with uh, a 45 that didn't have like 
a big hole that had like the spindle, you know, and it just felt so special. It felt unique. And from there, I don't know. Do you want me to mention songs that were like pre well, You, you have to imagine yeah. what's most important to you. Nobody can, nobody can understand that except you, because those are life-changing experiences. Like, yeah. for example, I'll ask this question to maybe help you along. How influential was Paul Casella bringing those tapes and taking you kind of under his pseudo wing? How important was that to you? <clears throat> it was everything. It changed my life. It's like I loved music and you know, I, I, I mentioned that I went for piano lessons as a young boy that I couldn't deal with the discipline. Then I picked up a guitar. I was showing, you know, playing by ear and learning chords, playing along with simple Beatle type songs. I went to guitar lessons. Same thing. I, I didn't I didn't want to, like, come home from school and go. I didn't have it. I was too young. I didn't have the <clears throat> what it takes. When I discovered the DJing thing, it clicked. And from that moment, I could tell you, I've never really done anything else. I've. <laughs> Do you know our lady of Mount Carmel in Brooklyn? Yeah, I know exactly. The they, is- they, they O'Gill. They do the O'Gill every year. I remember. Okay, everybody. A lady Mount Carmel is a big church in that area. They do the feast every July. And they used to have a singer, if I remember correctly, Jimmy Roselli used to come and sing. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't. And some of us would talk about, because my father went to the school over there, Eli Whitney and Vicky. Me too. But I dropped that. Of Eli. <laughs> my father's from that neighborhood. I grew up in Queens in the end. My father grew up in that area. And okay. so did Victor's father, Simonelli. So we kind of all have this thing. And every year we would all meet at that feast. So now take us to Lady Moncomo, please. Oh, my God. Sorry, I didn't mean to screw that up. But I got to explain that to everybody what that is. Yeah, you know, I almost for a second forgot why I brought up Our Lady of Moncomo. Because I was thinking of other jobs that I've had. Okay, so what's the other job that you do? So, you know, in the church, uh, they always have the church basements for, like, functions, the bingo and stuff. Well, Our Lady of Moncama basement had a bowling alley with just four lanes. And I used to set up the pins. <laughs> you know, you step on the pedal, the pins come up, and you set the pins on the thing. Then you release the pedal, and and... I was probably maybe 14. Please search for part two of this podcast on the platform you're watching or listening to. And please do not forget to follow us.